And uh, I'll uh, bring you up to speed on that in just a minute if you have your Bibles. Uh, let's look at uh, the fifth chapter of the, the book of Revelation. You, hang, you hold there if you get there for a while. Apparently you have. I'm, I didn't mark my place this time. Revelation chapter 5. Yeah, I did. I just didn't use the marker. Amen. Uh, look at verse 1. It said, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within. And on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel claim with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in, in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, uh, because no man was found worthy to open uh, and uh, to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith uh, unto me, Weep not. Uh, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, uh, which are the seven spirits of God sent <coughs> forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down uh, before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Uh, and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us. To God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And hast made us unto our uh, God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and heard the, the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands. And uh, saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb. That was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature that was in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and uh, which are in the sea. And all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that setteth on the throne unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Let's, so I want, for just a little while tonight, I, I want to take another glimpse into glory. Uh, we looked last week at glimpses of glory, and we're going to get another uh, picture of that in Revelation chapter 5 and see what John had to say. Let's, uh, let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. and I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us and for everything that you've given us. And I pray now uh, that you would bless the study. I ask you, Lord, that you would uh, just uh, touch hearts tonight. I pray, God, if there's somebody here unsaved, that you'd save them. I pray, Father, somebody out of fellowship, God, that you'd reclaim the backslider. I just ask you, Lord, that you have your way in every heart and every life, meet every need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I pray it in Jesus' name for his sake. And amen. Amen. I don't know if I went too far. I went too far, didn't I? Let's see here. I'll try to get back to the introduction. I don't know if I can make it anyway. You might have to override that thing back there, Sam. I'm not doing too good. But uh, tonight, for just a little while, I want to continue our study. You know, John's in heaven, and, and you'll, you'll find that uh, when he was first caught up, the first thing that he notices is a throne. And you'll find as you study the book of Revelation that uh, that word throne is used some 45 times in the book. And it's a book about the throne of God. Now, tonight we take a second look at the scene in glory. Yeah, there we are. Okay, you take it from here, Brother Sam, all right? And uh, uh, remember that I said that uh, it, when we talked about proceedings from the throne, we looked at several scenes around the throne last week. And we said that from the throne there went out lightnings and thunder. Now, anytime you see lightning and thunder, you know that a storm's getting ready to happen. Amen? 
And, so, and when you look, you're going to find that uh, there's a storm that's getting ready to take place. And you're going to find out about that in chapter number six. Now, the tribulation period is on the horizon. And so lightning and thunder went out from the throne. But as you come into chapter 5, you're going to find that the, that's just a little bit different. Now, the focus is not the throne anymore. The focus is the seven-sealed book. And in chapter 5, you, the, let, me, let me just say this, that the key to the book of Revelation, the key to understanding all that's after this, is found in that seven-sealed book. So it's really important that we understand exactly what that seven-sealed book was. And uh, when we talk about the seven seal book, uh, I, I, I want to take a little time and uh, kind of develop that. But let me say to you that uh, when we talk about the seven seal book, and we're going to uh, look at it in, in detail in just a little bit, uh, that it's very important to understanding the entire scheme and what happens from this point on in the book of Revelation. But nevertheless, uh, notice in verse 1, it said, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, a book written within and on the back side and sealed with seven seals. Now, when you look at that, number one, let me talk to you about the scroll. Now, when I say the scroll, uh, when you look at the word there, the word book is the word Biblon. And what he's talking about there is a scroll of parchment or a scroll of vellum. Now, it, I say that to say this, it'll help you understand uh, what you're looking at if you understand that it's a scroll that has to be rolled down. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about a book, we're talking about something that's got a cover out here and a cover back here. Well, that wasn't at all what it was. It was a scroll that was rolled up. And as the scroll was unrolled, you'll find that every time it was rolled down a little farther, that a seal had to be broken to reveal something else. Now, as you get to Revelation chapter number six, you'll find that uh, there are seven seals that'll, uh, that'll eventually be broken in the book of Revelation. All of that takes place uh, during that time period called the tribulation upon the earth. But nevertheless, uh, now there's one sitting on the throne and he's got a seven sealed book in his hand. And, and that seven sealed book is a seven sealed scroll uh, that will be rolled out and revealed. Now, let me say to you, and I want you to see number one. You're, thank you, brother. You're, you're doing good. And number one, I'd like for you to see the source of the scroll. Now, when I say the source of the scroll, I want you to notice that, that it's in the hand of the one who sits on the throne. Now, last week we developed that. We talked about that one who sat on the throne was, was God the Father. I mean, uh, we, we looked at the fact that the glory of God went out from around the throne. It looked like an emerald. Uh, you, you find that there was a, a rainbow, a green rainbow that went around the throne. And then uh, you find that before the throne, there was a sea of glass. And now there's one setting on the throne. And in the right hand of the one sitting on the throne, there's a seven sealed scroll. So the, uh, the source of the scroll, it was in the hand of God. But number two, you see the significance of the scroll. Now, for just a minute, I want to help you to see uh, what the scroll was. Now, just exactly what did this scroll represent? Well, one of the best ways to look at it is to go back, if you would. Now, I don't often do this, but look, go back, if you would, tonight uh, to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32. Now, this is the greatest picture of uh, what the scroll was. And you find that there the, the prophet Jeremiah does something very significant. And I'll, t I'll try to tell you about it in just a minute. But look at verse 9. And, and here the, the prophet Jeremiah does something symbolic. Uh, the land is in the, under the uh, domination of the Babylonians. But he is in faith he's going to buy a piece of land. And notice what it says. And I bought the field of Hamil, my uncle's son, that was in Anatoth. And, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. And I subscribed the evidence and I sealed it. And I took witnesses and weighed, uh, and weighed him the money. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom and that which was open. And I gave the evidence uh, of the purchase unto Baruch, the son of Neri, the son of Messiah, in, in, in the hand of Hananiel. Uh, uh, mine uncle's uh, son and in the presence of the witnesses that uh, uh, subscribed the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court 
all the prison. Now, for just a little bit, I, I want to help you to understand what was happening. Uh, what happened was uh, that Jeremiah bought a piece of property. It, 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 I said already that it was then occupied by the Babylonians. But in faith, he paid the price. And, 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 and in, in the company of all the witnesses, you find that the book was sealed. And, and, and with all the evidence, uh, the book, uh, this book was the title deed to the land or the portion of land uh, that he had bought. Now listen to me for just a minute. <laughs> it gets better as you go. And he would never in his lifetime be able to claim that land. But in faith he bought it because he believed the word of God said that the children of Israel were only going to be in Babylonian captivity for seven years. And he knew that his, that his heirs, he knew that his kin would someday redeem that land. But what you have when you talk about that's this scroll is you have a title deed. And in the case of the book of Revelation, that scroll that the man sitting on the throne was holding in his hand was the title deed to the earth. It was the title deed to creation. And, and when, you, when you consider that, uh, it's the same uh, scene in, in Jeremiah 32. And, and it was given, uh, you, you'll find if you study the Bible, that this title deed was given to Adam. Now you remember that when, when in the day that the, the earth was created, that Adam had dominion over the entire earth. But at the fall, <laughs> but at the fall he lost that. And the devil took over, amen. And, uh, and, and the devil had dominion. He's the prince and the power of this whole world. And he had dominion, are you listening? Until Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross of Calvary, amen. And then he lost his dominion, amen. Now, uh, I'm going somewhere, so you hold that right there, would you? And I'll help you with it in just a minute. And, but uh, you're going to find uh, that the devil is going to have dominion. He's going to exercise dominion. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you about it in just a minute. Until the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to tell you this. Listen to me real close. You'll hear me say it again. The devil may have dominion, but he's just a squatter. Amen. <laughs> Now, you, you ever heard about a squatter? They'll move on to a piece of land and they'll stay there. And a lot of times in a lot of places you'll find that if they stay there so long, then they've got what they call squatter's rights, amen. In, in, the, in the country of Nicaragua where I, I visited uh, this winter in January, if a person moves into your house and he occupies that house uh, for, a, for a certain amount of time, you know what? He's got the right to stay there. And so you have to be real careful uh, that, that you don't let somebody do that. You have to get them out. You have to evict them, all right? And, and, but let me say to you, <laughs> let me say to you that the devil is a squatter. Now I'm going to go on, all right? But then the scroll, well, what does the scroll represent? The scroll was the title deed to the earth. Now let me, let me go on. Number two, I want you to notice, if you will, the, the search. Now, I want you to notice a very specific question uh, that's asked in uh, Revelation chapter number 5. It says, it says in verse number 2, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Now, yeah, and so a question's asked. And they're looking for somebody that's worthy. They're looking for somebody that's worthy to go and take this seven sealed scroll, title deed to the earth, out of the hand of the man that sits on the throne. And that's the question they ask. They ask who is worthy to do it. And, and so you find it goes from a question to a quest. And all of a sudden there's a great search that takes place. And, 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 and the scripture said uh, when they started to look, uh, they began to search uh, for one worthy. And it says that no man in heaven uh, not notice it goes on to say and neither under the earth neither in the earth or, or, or under the earth uh, was able to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Now here's what they did. They turned the, they turned the universe upside down and they were just looking for one man that was worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. I mean they looked, they looked uh, in the earth. <laughs> uh, they looked in heaven. They looked under the earth and they didn't find anybody who could do it. Now you're going to notice that that was the search and you find number one the question who is worthy you find uh, you find number two the quest and they say no man was found worthy but I want to show you the third thing uh, that I want you to see tonight I, I want you to see uh, that uh, the Savior 
Now notice that uh, in, <laughs> in the text, in verse number four, John said, and I wept much because no man was found worthy uh, to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. He said, I begin to cry. I begin to weep because they searched, uh, they turned the universe upside down and no man was found worthy to do it. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, one of the elders, now you remember uh, from chapter number one that there were four and 20 elders and all the, all of a sudden one of those elders came and they, uh, and they uh, laid their hand upon him and they said, don't weep, John. He said, we found somebody that can open that book. <laughs> now, number one, let me say to you about the Savior. He, he was worthy to receive the scroll. Uh, now, when he says, don't weep, uh, he says, notice what he says. And one of the elders said unto me, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, uh, hath prevailed uh, to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Now, and, and, and he goes on to say, and I behold, and in the midst of the throne and of the four and twenty beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out, uh, uh, that are sent forth into the whole earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Now, uh, let me say to you, number one, not only was he worthy to receive the scroll, he was worthy to redeem. Now notice what, when you look at it, you'll find that it says of him, number one, he's the, uh, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now as you read the Bible, you'll find that uh, when Jacob, when Jacob uh, spoke to Judah, he said, Judah is a lion's whelp. He's prophesying now. He said, he, he, said, <laughs> he said, the scepter shall not depart from him. Uh, nor a lawgiver uh, between his knees until Shiloh come. Amen. And what he was saying was, that's a prophecy that the, that the Redeemer was going to come through Judah. But it not only said, not only did it say that, but it said, number two, that, uh, that he was the root of David. Now, when it says that, number one, let me say, let me say to you that, uh, number one, it was saying that he was the sovereign. Hey, now, he was the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he was the root of David. Now, he has the right to rule. He has the right to sit upon the throne. He's the only one. By the way, do uh, you, you know it was prophesied that that one that was set upon the throne, uh, he would be of the, of the root of David. He would be of the house and the lineage of David. And, and nevertheless, you find, number one, uh, he was sovereign. You find, number two, he was savior. Now, when old John looked, the elders said, <laughs> the lion of the tribe of Judah had prevailed, the root of David. And, and, but he went on to say, uh, and John turned and looked. Now when John turned and looked, he didn't see a lion, he saw a lamb, amen. And, and I'm gonna tell you something, uh, when I say he was a savior, I, I mean, uh, John, you'll find over and over again in the book of Revelations, he calls Jesus Christ the lamb, the lamb, the lamb. He's always the lamb. And I'm gonna tell you, he was, it was by the way, he was the one who was standing there at the river Jordan uh, when John the Baptist looked and said, behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. I mean, when he looked at him, he didn't see a, a sovereign, he saw a savior. And he, and he says in the text, he said, uh, as a lamb as it had been slain. And he wasn't talking about, uh, when he said slain, he was talking about violently slain. And he was talking about the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. You remember the Apostle Paul when he described the death of Christ the Bible says he became obedient unto death even the death of the cross it was the most heinous form of, of, of uh, capital punishment known to man in those days that a man would die on a cross and Jesus Christ the Son of God was violently slain when he died on the cross for our sin. He looked and he saw a, a lamb as it had been slain and so uh, you find uh, the, the Savior and you know, number one he was worthy to receive it because he was the sovereign, the lion of the tribe of Judah and, and the root of David. Number two, uh, not only uh, was he worthy to receive the scroll, he was worthy to redeem because he was the savior. Uh, he was a lamb uh, that had been slain. Let me show you the, sec the, 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 the something I, I want you to see. Now what they were looking for, why, why was it that they searched through heaven? <laughs> uh, they searched through the earth and they searched under the earth. And no one was found worthy. Well, could I say to you that the reason was they were looking for somebody to redeem the earth. 
They were looking for somebody who, had, who, who could uh, take the title deed to the earth. And that's the reason nobody was found worthy. Now, in order to find somebody, and they found the Lord Jesus, uh, in order to find somebody, it required three things. Number one, in order to redeem. Number one, it, it, a person had to be found. Now, not just any person. That person had to be a kinsman redeemer. And, and uh, do you realize that when they got Jesus, that he was a kinsman redeemer? And he was both God and man. Amen. Now, uh, I, I want to tell you this. Number one, because he was a man, he had the power to redeem me because he was a near, next of kin to me. Amen. But because he was God, he had the power to redeem the earth. Now, we're talking about, uh, what we're talking about here is the redemption of the earth. And, and, and a man... Uh, he had the, as a man, he had the right to uh, take back everything that Adam had lost. Now, I want you to remember that uh, when the right of redemption was exercised, that the kinsman redeemer uh, redeemed two things. He redeemed, number one, people, and he redeemed, number two, property. Now, you say, preacher, what are you talking about? Well, you remember the book of Ruth. You remember, you remember in the book of Ruth <laughs> that uh, old Ruth came back and she found her kinsman redeemer, and his name was Boaz. And, and, and she, there's a, it's a beautiful story, and I don't have time to get into all of it, but when she asked for the right of redemption, you know what happened? He said, there's a kinsman that's near in me. And, he, and you know the story about how that he had to go. And, and when he heard that there was a parcel of land to be redeemed, he was really very interested. But he said, listen, uh, Boaz said, listen, there's, not, there's more than that. He had a wife. And he said, no, he said, I can't do that because that would mar my inheritance. You know the story. He reached down and he took the shoe from off his foot and he handed it and, and he handed it to Boaz. That was called the covenant of a shoe. And, and, and what he was saying was, you, you can redeem her. And so there were two things that could be redeemed. And number one, people were redeemed. Number two, property was redeemed. I'm thanking God that one, number one, he's redeemed people. Amen. <laughs> he's redeemed you and me. I'm already redeemed. Amen. But not only that, he's re he has the right to redeem property. Now, now, when you look at it, that property, by the way, is the earth. Now, let me say, in order to redeem, number one, a person had to be found. Number two, a payment had to be made. Now, I'm going to tell you, as you read the book of 1 Peter, and I don't have time to get into it tonight, you'll find that the payment's already been made. Jesus Christ, I'm having a hard time tonight, amen. Jesus Christ has already made the payment. Well, I love reading that verse in 1 Peter when it says, as, uh, as a lamb, uh, that the, the price of my redemption was paid. It says, not with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, but, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. When Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, the payment of redemption and the price of redemption was paid by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And when he died on the cross, he not only died, to redeem people. He died to redeem the earth. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to give you something in just a minute. But as you look at it, the third thing, not only did a person have to be found and a payment had to be made, but the third thing was possession had to be taken. Now here's where I wanted to be. Now, you see, sometimes the redeemer didn't take a possession immediately. So what he had to do was <laughs> he had to go and he had to run those old squatters off. He had to get rid of those usurpers. Now listen to me for just a minute. I, I, I wrote this quote down. One of my favorite Bible commentators said this, that in a situation where a near kinsman didn't take immediate possession, he would have to evict the usurpers. Now let me say this. Are you listening? For over 2,000 years, over 2,000 years, the payment of my redemption has been made. Amen. He paid the price to redeem me and he paid the price for the redemption of the earth. But he hadn't come back <laughs> to take possession yet. And I want to say this. Uh, you see, the devil's been squatting on what rightly belongs to God. 
And, and, and the redemption price of the earth has already been paid. And one of these days, the rightful owner is going to come and take possession of what he's already paid for. Amen. Uh, so the lamb, is going, the lamb comes and he takes the book out of the man, hand of the man that sets upon the earth. And by the way, the reason he's the only one worthy because he's the kinsman redeemer. He's the only one that could pay the price. And, and he's the only one that could take possession. And now he comes and the, our kinsman redeemer. And he takes the, the scroll out of the right hand of the man that sits on the throne. Amen. Now for just a minute. I want to give you one, a couple more things. I want you to notice. Number two, the scene. Or number four, the scene. He comes and he takes it. Now, what happens when it all takes place? I'm going to tell you what happens. In heaven, it erupts in worship. Now, uh, <laughs> we've seen that happen in chapter 4. But look down if you have your Bibles. What it says in verse 7. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book. Here it is. The four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Now think about it for just a minute. Here's all them prayers that have been prayed down through the ages. Uh, how many times have you ever looked at that prayer that said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, Jesus said that when you pray, pray ye have to this manner. And by the way, if you've ever prayed like that, I'll tell you what, one of these days your prayer is going to be answered. Because somewhere up in heaven, all of those unanswered prayers, he's got them. And he's going to come and fall down before the throne. The four and twenty elders, by the way, you remember. Remember their representative number, the representative of the redeemed of all the ages. And they come and they fall down before the throne. And what happens in heaven is a scene of prayer and praise. Amen. Uh, those, five, those prayers are now before the throne of God. And by the way, let me say it again. You never pray to a prayer that he didn't answer. Amen. Now, I explained that statement last week. But he's answered every prayer. But, but what gets me is the, is the praise that takes place. Now, I'm going to tell you something. As you read the Bible, you'll find that the Scripture says that he inhabits the praise of Israel. Now, you know, when you praise God, he comes on the scene in a very special way. Now, here's what happens. They begin to sing a song. Now, they sang the song of the redeemed. <laughs> and, and number one, uh, what kind of song was it? Well, number one, let me say to you, it was a worship song. Hey, worship means to ascribe worth. And you're going to find that they said, thou art worthy. He said, you're worthy of our praise because you have redeemed us. You paid the price of our redemption. You, you redeemed us out of every tribe and kindred and, and nation. And, and we want you to know that you're the worthy one. They, and the word worship, by the way, means to ascribe worth. And they're telling him, hey, you're worship. And by the way, I want to tell you, when we praise God, you know, a lot of people... They criticize all kinds of music, but when we praise God, uh, we are in song, we ought to worship him. Amen. But, not, but not, let me say to you, number two, it was a redemption song. Notice what it says, thou hast redeemed us by thy blood. Now, when you look at that, it says, for thou wast slain. Now, in our day and time, there are a lot of modern churches that don't like to sing about the blood anymore. And they, and they accuse us who do of having a slaughterhouse religion. But I'm going to tell you, I believe we ought to keep singing about the blood. Amen. There is a fountain filled with blood uh, flow, uh, you know, and it flowed from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. And, and we ought to keep singing about the blood. Why, preacher? Because one of these days when we get to heaven around the throne of God, <laughs> you know what's going to happen? There's, Brother Fred, they're still going to be singing about the blood. Amen. Now, you know one thing that I forgot to mention as I come through that? You know, if you put this thing in its proper perspective, I, you know, most of the time you look at that and you think about Jesus at the incarnation come to the earth. And you think, well, they looked through heaven and they wanted to find one. So Jesus said, I'll go. And he came to there. That's not what that's talking about. You know what it's talking about? It's talking about the future. In Revelation 5, chapter 5, it's the future. He said, thou art worthy because thou hast redeemed us. Hey, them people around that throne's already been redeemed. And they're praising God for their redemption. Now, by the way, listen to this. The thing that struck me when I was in, <laughs> the thing that struck me when I was in the, in the study today was, you know what, I'm going to be there. 
I'm going to get to see that. I'm going to be standing back there. And I'm going to be standing back. Now, I already took the throne off my head, cast it on the pile, amen? And I'm going to stand back there. And I'm going to see, I'm going to see that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, come and take that the scroll out of the hand of him that sits on the throne. And bless God, you know what? I believe I'm going to be one of those standing around the throne of God that just starts praising him, amen? I'm going to be, I want to be able to be standing there. I, want to, I hope I've already thrown my, I hope I had some throw, uh, uh, crown to throw on the pile. And I just want to start praising him and saying, you're worthy. You're worthy because you've redeemed me. And I, I want to praise him for the redemption that I've got uh, and for all that he's done for me. I'm, hey, listen, I'm going to be standing there and you're going to be standing there around the throne and we're going to see Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, come and take that seven sealed <laughs> scroll out of the hand of him that sits on the throne. I got excited about that. I, I, and, and when I was studying today and I thought, Lord, just let me be able to come and, and let folks feel what I feel and see what I see. But not only that, you're going to find out that it was a kingdom song. Notice it says, and we shall reign. We shall reign with him on the earth. And, and so you find that when they begin to praise him, first of all, you see the song of the redeemed and then you see the sayings of the angel. Now, I don't know how, I don't know how I'd be able to contain myself if I wasn't in a glorified body. I mean, think about it. The redeemed of all the ages are singing around the throne of God and they're, they're praising him for all that he's done and for redeeming them. And all of a sudden, now the angels get involved. And you'll notice it says uh, that great multitude, someone said 100 million. And someone said that they were innumerable, that you couldn't, you couldn't uh, count them all. But think about it for just a minute. We, we're standing around the throne uh, singing and praising God. And all of a sudden, here are all the angels. Uh, they get involved and they begin to praise God. Now, I'll tell you what. I don't know about you, but I, but I, I almost bust open just thinking about it. I told you several times that there was a time when I was a young person that I went and I was in a crowd of about 6,500 people and I was in there and boy, I saw old Dr. <laughs> I said, <laughs> Dr. Faulkner lead that song, Behold He Comes. And, oh, and he was standing on the platform, and the platform was six foot high off the ground. And Dr. Faulkner raised his arms out like this, and he was leading one side after the other. And he would, he would lean to one side, and they'd say, Behold He Comes. And he'd lean to this side, and they'd say, Behold He Comes. And they'd, they'd do it again, Behold He Comes. And then he'd do both hands, and everybody would join in, and they'd say, With power and great glory. And boy, I'll tell you what, I thought I was just about to be raptured when I was standing there and I, I can't imagine what it's going to be like someday when all the redeemed of all the ages around the throne of God begin to worship him and all of a sudden the angels get involved and they begin to say you're worthy receive power and riches and strength and honor and glory and, and, and the angels of heaven say thou art worthy but it gets better than that think about it for just a minute say preacher how could it be any better notice if you have your Bible it says in every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne. Do you realize that every, crea every created being is someday going to praise God? Now, I, I want to tell you that some of those people that are under the earth, have you ever read the scripture in the book of Philippians? This is a parallel where it says, it says, and every knee shall bow. And it goes on through the, through the list. Uh, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen, I'll tell you what. I believe every created being in heaven is someday going to praise God. I believe every, every, created, cre every creature on earth is someday going to praise God. <laughs> and anyway, it went on and said, and, e and those that are in the sea. Now, there's some people that think <laughs> that that means people that have died. And listen to me, I don't believe that. You know what I, <laughs> you know what I believe? I believe all of God's creation. I believe, hey, I, I, I'm getting there, wait on me. <laughs> you know, I believe the fish in the sea are someday going to sing praise to God. Every created being is someday going to sing praise to God. Now, it ain't going to be great that when we're gathered around the throne of God in heaven and we're standing around there, that, that not, only does, not only do we sing worthy, not only do the angels say worthy, but everything that's ever been created, you know what they're waiting on? They're down there groaning 
and moaning. And remember, I preached it on Romans chapter 8. And they're waiting on the, the, the manifestation of the sons of God, the adoption and the redemption to wit. And I'll tell you what, when, I'm, when, I, when it's all revealed, you know what's going to happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen. The groaning is going to be over. And when the groaning is over, all of creation will someday raise their voice in a continuous anthem unto God. And they're going to be praising God throughout the endless ages of eternity. Amen. And it's going to be great. But nevertheless, as you look at it, you'll find that when the lamb comes and takes the seven seal scroll, heaven erupts with worship. Every created intelligence begins to worship God and him that sits on the throne. And you see, you get two glimpses of glory. You get one and the central theme is the throne. And you get another glimpse and the central theme is the seven script silk scroll. The title deed to the earth. What will, what will have to be done in order to subdue the earth and take possession. Oh yeah, they've already found the person. The payment's already been made. But now he has to come back. <laughs> And he has to take possession. Now that's what chapter 6 through, uh, through chapter 19 are all about. What's he going to do? Well, you're going to find out next week that the tribulation is going to start. And he's going to start rolling them seals off one by one. And he's going to read what's going to take place on the earth. By the way, don't you get discouraged. Don't you, don't you get down. Don't you get disappointed because one of these days Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is coming back to this old earth and he's going to take control and he's going to take possession of it. Amen. I want to tell you this. Listen. The devil is a squatter. And one of these days Jesus is going to come and take back everything that Adam lost. Amen. Bow your heads with me if you will.